my salvation. Say, Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my truth. Yeah. Jesus is my truth. Jesus is my peace. Your peace. Our peace. Jesus is my believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. We see revelation. We see revelation. We see the I'm fully blessed. I believe. I believe. I believe the word of God. We see revelation. I see revelation. I understand. I understand. I'm fully blessed to win. I will never, 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 never. I will never, never, never be the same. I will never, never, never be the same. I will never, never, never be the same. With the Holy Ghost power, I never, 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 I will never, no, never, never, never be the same. I will never, no, never, 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 I will never, 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 never be the same. With the Holy Ghost power, I take on the shield. I take on the shield of faith. I take on the sword of the Spirit. I take on the sword of the Spirit. I live by the word of God. 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 I will never, never, never be the same. I will never, never, never be the same. I will never, never, never be the same. With the Holy Ghost, I will never, 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 I will never, 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 never be the same. I will never, no, never, 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 never be the same. With the Holy Ghost, everybody give the Lord a shout. It is my pleasure to invite on stage our own Papa. Redeemed from death, redeemed from sin, by the power of the Holy Ghost, it's your season to win. Take your healing, take your freedom, take your favor. We come before your word humbly and respectfully. And we rejoice that we have access into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in this grace and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. As your word comes with clarity, revelation knowledge is gifted everybody under the sound of my voice. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. But in St. Yokes are destroyed. Your people are built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus is glorified. So, Father, we give you praise and glory and honor for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer sees a powerful amen. amen. Glory! Amen. Glory! Amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore, today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never, ever be the same again. In Jesus' name, and every believer says a powerful amen. 
Are we excited to fellowship together in the word? Can we celebrate our fellowship in the truth, in the word? Glory, glory. Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the world. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network. All of our social media community, brothers and sisters online, we want to welcome you to the service, guys. We're going to have a great time of studying. What a joy to have all of you. Do me the favor, share the videos, tag some people, drop them on as many groups as possible. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Abel Damina Ministries on YouTube. Also, you know, like the YouTube channel and of course also engage in the course of the service. Let's get this word to the ends of the earth. We also want to welcome the radio audience in Aquaibom State, wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice. We're so glad that you're a part of our church family and we're so glad that you're always tuning in to be equipped and built up with the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do me the favor, call a friend, a family member, a loved one, ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. Every Bible study has a destination. Every Bible study has a destination. A path must be created in every Bible study. A path must be created in every Bible study. That part is the word of truth. That part that the Bible study seeks to arrive at is the word of truth. And the word of truth, Acts chapter 20 verse 32 puts it like this. And now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So we call it the word of truth. And brother Paul calls it the word of his grace. So the word of truth is the word of his grace. In the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You shine as lights in the world. Next one. Holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain. So brother Paul calls you to the church in Philippians, the word of life. The word of life. So it is the path, which is the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the path in Bible study or the word of his grace or the word of life. The same thing, the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and of the intents of the heart. So the writer of Hebrew calls it the word of God. Revelation chapter 19 verse 13. And he was clothed with vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. His name is called the word of God. So the word of God is a person. The word of God is a person. The person of Jesus is the word of God. The word of God is a person. The person of Jesus is the word of God. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 1. That which was from the beginning. Which we have heard. Which we have seen with our eyes. Which we have looked upon. And our hands have handled. Of the word of life. Of the word of life. So John calls it the word of life. In John chapter 1 verse 1. He says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So he calls it the word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Brother Paul again calls it the word of reconciliation. That is the path that the Bible study seeks to arrive at. Every Bible study seeks to arrive at the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth or the word of his grace or the word of life or the word of God or 
the word of God being a person of Jesus or the word of life. Jesus is the life of God, the word of life or the word of reconciliation. So you must rightly divide it. The object of Bible study is not the ability to quote scriptures and mesmerize people or wow people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It is the ability to bring out the message or the ability to bring out the subject matter. The subject matter or the substance of the discourse. The subject matter or the substance of the discourse. It was a rhema in the Old Testament spoken among many things. A rhema, the word of God, the person of Jesus was a rhema spoken in the Old Testament among several other things. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, the writer of Hebrew puts it like this. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So Jesus is the logos of God. Jesus is the logos, the mind. Jesus is the purpose. Jesus is the will of God. The mind, the purpose, or the will of God. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, he says, Have in this last days spoken unto us in his son he hath in these last days spoken unto us in his son sundry times diverse manners the prophet spoke to the fathers hath in these last days god hath in these last days spoken to us in his son the king james says by no, Jesus is not the by of God. To, to be the by means you are running errands on behalf of God. Jesus is not speaking on behalf of God. Jesus is God speaking for himself. So hath in these last days spoken to us in his son. God has spoken only once. God has spoken only once in his son. In the Old Testament, sundry times, diverse manners, the prophets spoke to the fathers. And the only time God personally, specifically spoke is in his son. God spoke by himself in his son. Because Jesus is the revelation of God. That's why the writer of Hebrews should now put it in the next verse. Who being the brightness of his glory. That's the sun. The sun is the brightness of his glory. And the express image of his person. And upholding all things. By the word of his power. When he had by himself. Spoken to us. In his son. Who has by himself. Purged our sins. And after purging our sins. Sat down. On the right hand of the majesty on high. Somebody getting blessed. Can I have a powerful amen? So Jesus is the substance and the essence of scripture. Jesus is the substance and the essence of the scriptures. If you get lost in the stories. And cannot see what speaks of Christ. You are truly lost. If you get lost in the stories of the Bible. And cannot identify what truly speaks of Christ. Then you are truly lost. In Luke chapter 24. In a Bible study. Jesus now looked at those guys on the way to Emmaus. And said to them from verse 25 to 27. O fool slow of heart. To believe. Take note of that. To believe. Alright now. He didn't say to know what the prophets have said. But to believe. Because they've been reading the prophets. That's why I say they are slow of heart. They've been reading the prophets. They've been reading the prophets. But they didn't believe. Why didn't they believe what the prophets have said? Because they couldn't identify the substance. They could not identify the essence of the speakings of the prophets. 
So since they couldn't identify the substance and the essence, the ability to believe was not given to them. Because it is at the point of the understanding of the subject matter of the scriptures that faith comes alive. So Jesus said to them, they were slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Next verse. Ought not Christ, if you were reading well, you should have seen that the Christ ought to have suffered. It's there contained. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He now began to sort them out. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So we said that Christ in the Old Testament, and they permit the use of this word, is scattered among the prophecies. Christ in the Old Testament is scattered among prophecies, among promises, among prophecies, among prophecies, among events, sacrifices, exploits, victories, hope, faith, offerings, and so many things. Jesus, permit the use of that word, is scattered in the Old Testament in the prophecies, in the promises, in the events, sacrifices, exploits, victories, hope, faith, offerings, and among so many things. Christ is hidden in those things. That's why it's called mystery. He is hidden in those things. And if you are not careful, you can be carried away by those things and miss the narrative of scripture. You can get caught up in those stories, get caught up in the events, get caught up in all the activities and miss the substance and the essence of the communication. Jesus is the hope of Israel. He is the faith of Abraham. He is the ark of Noah. He is the offering of Abel. Yeah. He is the offering of Abel. He is the song of the weary. Oh yes. He is the cave where David hid in and escaped his assailants. He is the song of the psalmist. He is the song of the psalmist. Oh yeah. He is the seed in the garden of Eden. Oh yeah. He is the tree of life in the garden of Eden. Yes. He is the life that had the light and became the light of man. So Jesus is the very substance and the very essence of the Old Testament. He is everywhere in the Old Testament. As long as we can be diligent to see where these things are communicated. Because if you look at the state of humanity with the fall of Adam, nothing was supposed to move well at all. Man died. Man was lost. Man rejected the life of God. And man received judgment. There was a curse upon the earth. So every light and life and hope that we see that brings men to God and God to men had to be communicated in a figurative communication. Had to be communicated in a figure of speech or had to be communicated symbolically because of the state of fallen man. Had to be communicated using earthly things to bring out spiritual lessons because of the fallen nature of fallen man. Can I have a good amen? So because of that, the scriptures therefore must be rightly divided. A path has to be created in Bible study to arrive at the truth of the scriptures. Now we began to say that we're going to identify Jesus by what Jesus says about himself. We're going to identify Jesus by what Jesus says about himself. And what others say about him. We're going to look at three to four names. Three to four names. Actually about four names 
and you will discover Jesus was called four different things that are very critical in the understanding of Christianity. Jesus is the reason for Christianity. He's the reason behind it. If you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian. To, to be a Christian, Christ-like, you've got to know the Christ of the end. You have to know the Christ because the Christ is the substance and the essence of Christianity. If you don't know Christ, you're actually not a Christian. Okay? You're just wearing a label that necessarily does not describe you. You're just carrying a label that doesn't belong to you. Because you can only be called a Christian by the revelation of Christ Jesus who takes up residence in the heart of those who believe the gospel. So there were four things he was called. Please pay attention. You know, today we don't call him Lamb of God. If you call Jesus the Lamb of God today, it is because you are ignorant. That's why you call him a Lamb. Because that word Lamb of God is a figurative description of his sacrificial work. Okay, a figurative description of his sacrificial work. And he has finished that sacrificial work. So we don't call him the Lamb of God. Again, remember, we took time to establish a number of things. You know, of, of course we can say it, you know. And that you call him Lamb of God doesn't mean you committed a sin. Okay, it just means that, uh, you know, there's an understanding that you are yet to arrive at. We can call him bread of life. Bread of life. Send down from glory. Because he is the bread of life. That's who he was. He's no longer the bread of life. That's who he was. The word bread of life was used as a figurative communication. Because it was a communication to men that are not saved. A communication to men that do not have the spirit. Because the word has become flesh. So he's no more bread. The word has become flesh and dwelt among us. The word has become flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the father. But is it wrong to call him the rose of Sharon? The lily of the valley? The bride and the morning star? He is the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He is the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. So I still remember the song. I'm just trying to, you know. It's a long time I sang that song. All right? But you know, the Bible is in progressive revelation. We can have more insights and we can have more depths as to who he is. That's what we're learning. And the better we know, the clearer it gets for us, the stronger our persuasion and our conviction about the person of Jesus Christ. So yes, if you want to call him the lily of the valley, there's nothing wrong with that. But all those are figurative expressions of the person of Jesus Christ. You know, if you look at the four gospels, you will see that Jesus was called Jesus. Jesus. In the four Gospels. He was called Jesus. That's who he was. Now remember, we are looking at who he was, who he is, and who is to come. Who he was, who he is, and who is to come. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever the same person he has never changed i the lord i change not jesus the same yesterday today and forever i the lord i change not note this and take note of this in the four gospels he was called jesus and no adjective added to it no adjective added to it like when we say Jesus Christ. Christ is an adjective added to Jesus. Christ is an adjective. But Jesus is a person. <laughs> Jesus is a person. But Jesus Christ or Lord Jesus are adjectives. 
Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, they are adjectives. Now, where he was called Jesus with no adjective, 612 times in the four gospels. Jesus with no adjective was used 612 times in the four gospels. In the other books, he was called Jesus alone, no adjective, 71 times. Jesus alone, no adjective added to the name Jesus, 71 times in the other books. And interestingly, if you're a Bible student here, pay attention. 38 of the 71 times is in the book of Acts. 38 of the 71 times is in the book of Acts, which is a transitional material. The book of Acts is a transitional material. A book that is historical that speaks of how the church grew in Revelation. A historical book that exposes to us how the church grew in Revelation. So in the growth of Revelation, we have him called Jesus 38 times without any adjective. And most of the times when it was called Jesus only was to refer to the events of the four Gospels. The events of the four Gospels. So he was called Jesus only 71 times. And 38 of the 71 times was in the book of Acts. Note this. In the four Gospels, he is called Christ. He is called Christ 56 times in the four Gospels. He is called Christ 56 times. However, in the other books, he is called Christ 256 times. In the other books, he is called Christ 256 times. That shows you the usage of that title. Which means that title, Christ, had to do with dispensation. It had to do with dispensation. 256 times Christ in the other books. What does it mean? So Christ was used more after he rose from the dead. After Jesus rose from the dead, he was called Christ. That was more in use. Christ, 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 Christ. After his resurrection. Jesus was used more before he died. He was called Jesus, Jesus, Jesus more before he died. When he rose from the dead, he was called Christ more after resurrection. What is the history of the name Jesus? Of course, the name Jesus is the Greek word Iesus, I-E-O-S-U-S, Iesus, I-E-O-S-U-S. We're looking at the history of the name, Jesus, which was taken from the Hebrew word Yeshua. So Jesus is Yeshua in Hebrew. Jesus is Yeshua in Hebrew. He is Yeshua in Hebrew and he is Isios in the Greek, which is Jesus. Please, that's very important. Now, that word Yeshua is the word Joshua. So, Jesus is Joshua in Hebrew. Yeshua. Yeshua means Joshua. Okay? That's why in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11, Joshua was translated as Jesus. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now go back to verse 5. Let me start from verse 5. And in this place again, if they shall enter into his rest. Next verse. Seeing therefore it remained that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day saying in David today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, Joshua, for if Jesus had given them rest, if Joshua had given them rest, because it wasn't Jesus, 
that took the children of Israel after the death of Moses. It was Joshua. But because Jesus is Yeshua in the Hebrew. So that's why the writer of Hebrew now used the word Jesus. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remained therefore a rest. Okay? So that word Joshua is the word Jesus. Yeshua is yours. Now Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. His name is Jesus, no adjective. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus. Now, that was the name given to him. Please listen to me. The name Jesus is an adjective on its own that you cannot add to it. When you are referring to what it represents. You can't add to it because the name Jesus is an adjective on its own. And there's a reason why it is called Jesus. You don't add an adjective to the name Jesus. Because it will not allow you to get the full import of that name Jesus. In the intent with which he was given that name. And someone says... Why I am saying this, and you will see it in a very few minutes. In Bible language, names mean a lot. In Bible language, for example, Jehovah El Shaddai. To the Jew, if you say Jehovah El Shaddai, the great, is an insult. If you just say Jehovah El Shaddai, the great, is an insult. And it is irreverence among the Jews. Because El Shaddai speaks of itself. So to try to call El Shaddai the great means you don't know what El Shaddai means. Are we teaching here? Just like if you say, dear Jesus, lovely Jesus, it's a bit rude. If you are referring to what we are going to talk about. Because that name needs no adjective. That's why his name shall be called Jesus. Not darling Jesus. Not sweet Jesus. His name shall be called Jesus. You know, the Bible is such an intelligent material. Very intelligent. It takes only a degree of supernatural intelligence to access the treasures in it. And it was written by intelligent people under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So, that's why it's important to stay with the narratives of scripture. So, the name Jesus is an adjective that God gave. For example, when you say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The sweet, that sweet is carnality. That sweet is ignorance. Because the fellowship, the word fellowship means sweet. The word fellowship means sweet. So you don't add sweet to the fellowship. It means you don't understand what the fellowship means. <laughs> Praise God. The fellowship of the spirit is sweet. It's the sweetness itself. The fellowship. So to say the sweet fellowship or dear Jesus is not necessary because that name means something. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save. The reason why he is called Jesus. Not sweet Jesus. But Jesus is because he shall save his people from their sins. Are you still here? Okay. He shall save his people from their sins. That's the meaning. 
Jesus is not just Savior. He is Jehovah is our salvation. That's the meaning of Jesus. Jehovah is our salvation. When you say Jesus, what you are saying is Jehovah is our salvation. It's not just Savior. Jehovah is our salvation. So it's not a nickname like darling, sugar, sweet. Mm -mm. Jehovah is our salvation. Now, it's not a sin if you call him darling Jesus. But it's not spiritual. <laughs> if you call him darling Jesus, it's not spiritual. It's not a sin. But it's not wrong to say it. That means... He shall save his people from their sin. It is the name of Jesus' earthly life. The name Jesus is his earthly name. Is the name of his earthly life. It is the name of his sin-bearing life. And the name Jesus is the name of his suffering. The name Jesus is the name of his suffering. You know on the cross, there was an inscription on the cross of Jesus. How many of you remember? What was on the inscription? This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. The name of his suffering. That was his earthly name. No adjective. Don't call him lovely Jesus, sweet Jesus, dear Jesus. The name Jesus speaks of itself. Jehovah is salvation. That was the name given to us. There was no dear in the Bible. There was no sweet in the Bible. His name is Jesus. That name means something. That name is a revelation on its own. He shall bear the sins of his people. He shall save his people from their sin. Not this. Do you know that you will not find the word in Jesus throughout all scripture? In Jesus. You will not find it anywhere. Throughout all scripture. In Jesus. But you will find in Christ. You will find in Christ. But you will not find in Jesus. Okay. Why? Because of what the name Jesus was. So you cannot find in Jesus. But you will find in Christ. Interestingly, there was one translation that wants to defeat what I'm saying now. But let me get there quickly before all of you and explain. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 14. For if we believe, pay attention, that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus. Which sleep in, that's the only place you will find that. And I will explain to you right now. Which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him? No, it's not in, in the original. It is which sleep by Jesus. Which sleep by Jesus will God bring with him? Which sleep by Jesus. They slept by Jesus, not in Jesus. So you won't find in Jesus because there is no such uh, name in the Bible. But you'll find in Christ. In Christ refers to the glory that will follow. Jesus refers to the suffering. In Christ is the glory that will follow. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So the suffering identifies with the name Jesus. The glory that will follow identifies with the name Christ or in Christ. All right, now look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ that same Jesus it is the same Jesus 
but functioning differently after resurrection. After resurrection, Christ. In his suffering, Jesus. The same Jesus, God has made him both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Christ. That same Jesus in suffering, now in resurrection, God has made the same person, both Lord and Christ. God has made him, but Lord. Now Peter begins to tell us how he died. That same Acts chapter 2 verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. Which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. Next verse. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So Peter gives them the history of the sufferings of Christ. Then he now concludes it in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you have crucified. What has God made him now? Both Lord and Christ. That will come in handy in a few minutes. So, his lordship began when he rose from the dead. The lordship of Jesus began when he rose from the dead. That's when he became Lord and Christ. That was when he became Lord and Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let this man be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Next verse. Who being in the form of God taught it not robbery. To be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore. Wherefore. God also hath highly exalted him. And given him a name. Which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow. Of things in heaven. And things in earth. And things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. So upon his resurrection. He is called Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. Now, when did this happen? When he was born? Was he called Lord when he was born? When was he called Lord? When he rose from the dead. That's the Christ. The Christ is the Lord. So it's actually the glory of God the Father. However, notice... It is when he rose from the dead that he was exalted. And I have told you there is the resurrection and there is the ascension. There is the resurrection and there is the ascension. When he was exalted and then he became Lord. Now notice that he is called Christ. Christ 56 times in the Gospels. He is called Christ 56 times in the four gospels and 256 times in the epistles 256 times in the epistles christ is from the hebrew word meshach meshach where you have the anointed one meshach the anointed one it is not messiah jesus is the one that came to save the anointed one in the Greek, is called Christos. In the Greek, Christos. In the Hebrew, Meshach. The Christ, the anointed one. It speaks more of a position than a person. In Christ, Christos, the anointed one. That's a position more than a person. He speaks more of a place. 
a position than a person. It actually speaks of the glory. Luke chapter 24 verse 44. He said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 46 now. And said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. To suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So it says he will enter his glory after three days. He will enter his glory after three days. And that is where we are identified now. We are identified today with that glory that he entered after three days. In First Peter chapter 1 verse 10, look at the way Peter will communicate these thoughts of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, next verse, such in what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand what? The sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Wow. That's why in the epistles, what you will see the most is in Christ. Christ in. It's a place. It's a place. That is the glory. In Christ. Christ in is a place. It's a function. That is the glory that followed the sufferings of Christ. He is also called Lord, the Greek word kurios, one that has dominion. One, Jesus, two, Christ, three, Lord, Lord, the kurios, one that has dominion, the owner of something, like the, like the owner of a territory, one who dictates what happens, the owner of a territory, the Lord. The Lord of glory. The Lord of glory. Woo! He is the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. He is the Lord of glory. Now notice this. At salvation, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, you confess his lordship, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you confess with your mouth what? The Lord Jesus. His Lordship. If you were to translate it today, it will be, if you will confess with your mouth the Lordship of Jesus. The Lordship of Jesus. That's the way it will have sounded if it was today. It is more than just calling him Lord. It is accepting his lordship. The lordship of Jesus. The word kurios is an absolute sovereign ruler. An absolute sovereign ruler. The lordship of Jesus. Somebody who is in charge. Now notice where that word is singularly used to the believer who is unmarried to the unmarried in first corinthians chapter 7 verse 39 the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth but if her husband be dead she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the lord only in the lord not only in christ only in the Lord. Marry in the Lord. It's actually an instruction. It's, an instru it's not an advice. It's an instruction. It's a command. You must marry under the Lordship of Jesus. You must marry. Whoever you want to marry must be under the Lordship. You too under the Lordship. Both of you marry under the Lordship of Jesus. Only in the Lord. It's is deliberate. <laughs> Brother Paul is deliberate in the way he wrote it. Look at Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands 
as it is fit in the lordship of Jesus. As it is, you're under a supreme sovereign ruler. So under his lordship, you only do things that are fit under that government. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. As it is fit where? In the Lord. In the dominion and authority of Jesus. It's not a suggestion. Everywhere you find in the Lord, it's a command. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. In the Lordship of Jesus. For this is right. Colossians 3.23 And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. As to the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 11, the cup of the Lord, the body of the Lord, the blood of the Lord. That's the way Brother Paul taught that. The cup of the Lord, the body of the Lord, the blood of the Lord. That means you have no impute. He is the Lord there. He is the Lord, the table of the Lord. The cup of the Lord, the body of the Lord, the blood of the Lord, the table of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the spirit of God called Jesus a cost. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> no one can say that Jesus is the Lord. Recognize and accept the Lordship of Jesus but by the Holy Ghost. We have looked at Christ we have looked at Jesus and there are times those words are used together. Jesus Christ. So we have Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that right? Okay. In Greek and Hebrew languages, when you mention something first and there are two words like compound word, the first letter is the emphasis of that compound word. The Lord God. So the emphasis will be Lord. Jehovah our salvation. The emphasis will be Jehovah. The Lord is here. The emphasis will be the Lord. Okay. So the emphasis is the first word. You will discover that the first writers of the New Testament played with the word Christ Jesus and Jesus Christ. Remember where we're coming from. All right? We're coming from the mention of Jesus. And in mentioning Jesus, you are mentioning his suffering. Okay? The name of Jesus identifies you to what? The name Christ identifies you to what? The name Lord identifies you to what? His Lordship after what? After, correct, correct. Very good. It's good to know because um, that's very critical because we're dealing with precise knowledge, right? We're dealing with revealed knowledge. We're dealing with accurate knowledge. And that's very critical because that helps you to acknowledge the good things that are in you in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now. So when you mention Christ. You are mentioning exaltation. His exaltation. When you mention Lord. You are mentioning his dominion. Christ. Exaltation. Lord. Dominion. Jesus. Suffering. Look at this interesting discovery. Notice the way brother Paul. Addressed. This church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Wow. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? There was an emphasis in each verse. When we say Jesus Christ, the emphasis is on the fact that he was humiliated 
and exalted. Jesus Christ. The emphasis is on the fact that he was humiliated and then exalted. It brings to our mind the humiliation, the suffering of Jesus that led to the glory. When you say Christ Jesus, it refers to where we are today. We are where we are today based on his sufferings. We are where we are today based on his sufferings. When you say Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, we are where we are today based on his sufferings. And he says, saints in Christ Jesus. That's the way Paul addressed the church in Philippi. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ then servants of Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, just like Jesus was sent forth to bear the reproach and to serve these folks, these folks also were sent to serve, you know, others. That's why they call themselves servants. And we are sent today because of Jesus upon his suffering. So we identify with him in his sufferings. We identify with Christ in his sufferings. That's why Philippians 2 5 now says, Let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we are in Christ the suffering Savior. In Christ Jesus. We are in Christ the suffering Savior. So because we are in Christ the suffering Savior, we also we will suffer with him in service. In serving his purpose and serving his will on earth to humanity. And then the Lord Jesus Christ refers to his dominion. The Lord Jesus Christ. His rule, his power. And says there's grace that comes from that towards us. The Lord Jesus Christ. His dominion. So all those titles. Just like when you say. How God anointed. Jesus of Nazareth. Anointed Jesus. Acts 10 38. How God anointed. Jesus of Nazareth. Not Jesus Christ of Nazareth. How God anointed. Jesus of Nazareth. With the Holy Ghost and with power. So when you say Jesus, it's an adjective. When you say Lord, it's an adjective. It describes something. When you say Christ, it also describes something. But everything is an identity. Jesus is an identity. Christ is an identity. Lord is an identity. So everything we are spoken of to be in Christ, we are identified. See? Whatever the Bible says for us that we are now in Christ is an identification. We identify with his exaltation. We are identified with where he is today. Wherever he is, that is where we are. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. Also in these books, you will find out that he is called the son of man. He is called what? The son of man. We saw who he was. We are looking at who he was and who he is today. Is that right? Who he was and who he is now in his exaltation, the Christ, who is the Lord. Okay? Now, he is called the Son of Man. But you have observed that he was also called the Son of God. So he was called the Son of Man. He was called the Son of God. In fact, I will show you where they were used interchangeably. Son of Man, Son of God. Son of man refers to his humanity. Son of God refers to his divinity. He is 100% a man as though not God and 100% God as though not man. Son of man, son of God. Son of man, humanity, son of God, divinity. Son of God is the son of man. <laughs> son of God is the son of man. That means there is a corporal union of divinity in humanity. There's 
a union of divinity in humanity. When the son of God is now the son of man. Humanity in divinity or divinity in humanity. So, divinity in humanity is called Jesus Christ. Divinity in humanity is called Jesus Christ. The word became flesh. The word became a man. The word became a man. God became a man. The word became a man. <laughs> the word became a man. God became a man. Who? Oh? Eh? Where does the Bible say that Jesus is God? The word became a man. God became a man. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Verse 14. And the word God became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus God became a man. Christ. Okay. And dwelt among us. So Jesus is God who became a man. And dwelt among men. Since we cannot go to God, God has to come to us because one must go to the other for there to be a relationship. But God cannot come to us as God because this planet cannot contain the full essence of God. Hey. So just like you too cannot go to heaven with this body. Because this body is not designed for a place called heaven. Heaven is a place, but not a material place. Mars is material. Jupiter is material. So outer space and this cannot be, cannot be the heaven of God. Because the heaven of God is immaterial. So since you Cannot go to outer space like this because this body was created for earth. For earth. You came from dust, so you live where dust is. You are created from dust. You go back to dust. You and dust have to function together. Your means of survival is from dust. You plant trees and fruits and food from the ground to eat to survive. The most healthiest people on earth are people that thrive in an environment where there is more organic material. Uh -huh. I'm teaching here now. Where there's a lot of organic. Okay, There's a lot of rubbish in our society today. That's why there are diseases that medical science is still contending with. Because when you feed this body, what was not properly designed for this body, there will be a malfunction. That malfunction is what you call disease. Disease is this is something that diseases you. You are not at ease because they say this. What brought the this is because you ate what does not allow for ease. I'm teaching here. Okay, so since you cannot go to outer space with this like this, they wear you a space suit because this is an earth suit. This body is an earth suit. That's why when people die, this body remains here. But they have died. It is this body, they, they remove the suit and drop it. And the real person goes. You don't find him in the suit anymore. He removed the suit. Eh? So what keeps him functional here is the suit he's wearing. But when his time here is up and he's tired of here, he, 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 they don't collect it from him. Just, you see, you see, I've just unbuttoned my suit, right? Did you see I've unbuttoned my suit? Pastor Philemon, come and stand with me. Here. So now I have unbuttoned my suit. Don't come close. Don't come close. It's my suit, not your own. Don't come close. <laughs> just like, don't come close. Who removed my suit? I removed my suit. Okay? When I remove this suit and I give him, I'm no more in the suit. I'm not in it. 
I'm no more there. I'm gone. When we say somebody dies, what he did was to remove the suit and exit the suit. And the moment you exit the suit, you can no more function here because you need the suit to function here. But with this suit, with this suit, wait first. With this suit, I can operate here. Eh? Okay. If I must go to outer space, because outer space is not earth. This body can't function there. So they wear me a space suit that makes me compliant with the environment and make me able to function. But even with that, with training, because they will have to train me because in outer space, I don't walk like this. In outer space, you float. Sometimes, you can even be upside down. Okay? So, they have to wear you what makes you compliant. God Almighty decides to come to the earth which he created. God decided to come to the earth which he created. So what will God have to do? He can't come because he is not compliant with the earth. He existed before the earth. So he cannot be compliant with the earth. And the people that will live in the earth are not God. So the earth is not compliant with him. But he has to come in. So he humbles himself. He humbles himself. And if he is God, he should be whatever he wants to be. I don't know if you understand that. When they say, how can God have a son? If he is God, he should be whatever he wants to be, whenever he wants to be, anyhow he wants to be. That's why he's God. So he now decides so that you and him can relate. That's why he created you to relate. He now put himself in an earth suit. Stayed in the womb of Mary nine months. Proper, proper earth suit. And came out. So, and the word which is God became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory but upon his resurrection his heavenly suit swallowed his earthly suit okay the heavenly suit which is immortal has the capacity to function on earth but in the resurrection. And it has the capacity to disappear from earth still in the resurrection. So in the immortal you can switch earth, heaven, earth, heaven you can switch the immaterial body. That's why Paul said we desire to be clothed. We are not looking for how to be naked. But we want to be clothed so that mortality can be swallowed up of life. That immortal cloth is called life. And that life is in you. And that's what they call rapture. So rapture is not a prayer point. Rapture is in you now. And when the moment comes, it will manifest. And mortality will be swallowed up of life. Everything we are spoken of to be in Christ, we are identified with his exaltation. The word became flesh 
and dwelt among us. What does that mean? Well, first of all, that word is used interchangeably. Let's see where it is used. John chapter 5 verse 20 to 23. For the father loveth the son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than this that ye may marvel. Next verse. For as the father raised up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the son quickeneth whom he will. For the father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. Watch this. That all men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son, honoreth not the father which has sent him. Next verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Next verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Now he has spoken about two concepts. Life and judgment. Life and judgment. And they shall live. So we receive life from the son of God. We receive life from he that has the son has life. We receive life from the son of God. Look at verse 26 and 27 of that John where we just read. For as the father had life in himself. So had he given to the son to have life in himself. And had given him authority to execute judgment. Also, because he is the son of man. Life is with the son of God. Judgment is with the son of man. Life is with the son of God. Judgment is with the son of man. So everywhere you find judgment and authority, you will see anywhere you find judgment and authority that Jesus is described as a man there. Anywhere you find judgment and authority. Look at Acts 17.31 so that you see what I'm teaching. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he would judge the world in righteousness. By who? By that man. So judgment is by the son of man. By that man whom he had ordained. Whereof he had given assurance unto all men. In that he has raised him from the dead. So judgment is by the son of man. Life is by the son of God. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 13. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 12. But this man, who? This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, who judged sin? This man. He is the judgment for sin. This man. Psalm 110 verse 1 and 2. Referring to judgment. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. That is judgment. Okay? That is judgment. So Jesus will execute judgment as a man. He gives life as the son of God. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So Jesus, the man, is the judgment of sin. So life, son of God, judgment. Can I hear it very loud? Judgment, life, son of God. So all these things are not carelessly written. That's why Bible study is important. These things I'm teaching are not carelessly written. They are to be studied because they, they form the foundation for certain statements 
that you make in the course of studying and teaching God's word. They are titles that identifies each function that Jesus Christ carries. So if you look at the four gospels, you will see him called Jesus, Lord, by those who just call. You will see him called the Son of God and also the Son of Man, which describes his identification with humanity. You will see him called the Son of God in glory as touching his identification from God. So each title has its meaning. Each title has what it represents. They are not carelessly written in scripture. You don't just use them anyhow. You must know what they represent. Jesus, Christ, Lord, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Man. They all have what they represent. Okay? Hallelujah. So really you discover that the writers of the epistles, they didn't just use adjectives carelessly. They were very careful in how they described him because they had to describe him from the scriptures. Don't describe Jesus from your emotions. Describe him from the scriptures. Stop where the scriptures stop and be loud where the scriptures are loud and be silent where the scriptures are silent. He's called Jesus. He is called the Christ. He is called the Lord. And each of them have what they stand for. Can somebody shout hallelujah? You know, many people call God different names. But you see, what he is to us in the scripture is our father. Uh, what is he? Our father. See, our father is bigger than any other. All the adjectives you will put together to describe him. It's not equals to our father. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkino. All of those are descriptions of Jesus. But when you say father, father carries all. The ones you know plus the ones you don't know. Our father. Hallelujah. Somebody shout our father. Can I hear you shouting very loud? Can I hear you shouting loudest? He's called the father of lights. Father of lights. With whom there is no variableness, neither a shadow of turning. He is called the father of spirits. Our father, the father of lights, the father of spirits. The father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The father of glory. <laughs> The father of light, the father of spirits, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory. The Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God, our Christ, our Lord. And if you say, my dear Jesus, dear has no spiritual value. My darling Jesus, darling has no spiritual value. Darling Jesus, darling Jesus. Oh my darling, is a canal, canal, there's a canality. That's <laughs> praise God. I say praise God. To us, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. To us, he is the father of glory. To us, he is the Lord Jesus Christ who was, who is, and who is to come. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We are named in his name. He is the Father of glory. And we are partakers of that glory. We are partakers of that glory that followed the sufferings of Christ. We are products of that glory. We came out of his glory. We are We are products of God's glory. That's why he has called us to glory and to virtue. Hallelujah. I didn't hear you shout a powerful amen. Say he's my father. Say the father of glory. Say the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you stand up and just walk to two, three people, tell them, he is my father, Abba father. He is my Abba. He is my Abba. Abba father. God has set forth his spirit 
God has set forth his spirit. God has set forth his spirit. Where is the spirit of God? In our hearts. What is the cry of the spirit of the born again man? Abba. Do you know that every time you say Abba Father, that is worship. That is worship. Abba Father. Revelation knowledge like never before. The eyes of your understanding flooded. 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 Flooded with light. In the name of Jesus. And I declare over you, you grow in grace. You grow in wisdom. In the name of Jesus. You grow in grace. You grow in wisdom. In the name of Jesus. Grace and peace is multiplied unto you. Grace and peace is multiplied unto you. In the name of Jesus. Kaya Libro Sakentana. You have sufficiency in all things. You have sufficiency in all things. Leko Sabara Katona Kata. Membro Jakala Namasa. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. You have sufficiency. You have sufficiency. You have sufficiency. Say with me, I have sufficiency. Now say it three times. I have sufficiency. Two more times. One more time. Now say with me, I have sufficiency in all good things. Now say it two more times. Say it one more time. Now shout it loud. I abound unto every good work. Woo! I abound unto every good work. I abound unto every good work. I will abound in every good thing and in all that I need. In all we good thing, I will abound. We abound unto every good thing. We abound in everything that redemption has provided. Amen. And I decree that the remaining days of your life, there is no insufficiency. Say, I am God sufficient. Say it two more times. Say it one more time. So when they tell you, ah, everything is finishing, say no, 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 no. Everything cannot be finishing. I am God sufficient. Amen. I am God sufficient. And Father, I pray for everybody in this service, everybody online, everybody on radio, everybody listening to the sound of my voice. You are sufficient in every good thing. In the name of Jesus. And I command the devil to take his hands off everything that pertains to you in the name of jesus sick bodies be healed sick bodies be healed sick bodies be healed in the name of jesus father we give you praise father we give you glory we give you honor and we thank you for answered prayer hallelujah in jesus precious name and every believer says that amen on a note of finality can we celebrate the word of God in this place? Glory! Amen. Lift up your offerings, Father. We are sufficient in all things. We have sufficiency. We are God sufficient. And we thank you that everything we have, we have because you gave. Thank you, Father. We do not keep our resources from the advancement of your kingdom. So in the name of Jesus, we give with joy, we give in faith, and we're excited about making our monies available for the advancement of your kingdom. And we thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for the blessing over your people in Jesus' precious name. And every believer sees a powerful amen. Glory to God. We trust that you have been blessed by this message. To order the complete series of this message and all the messages by Dr. Abel Daminer, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com. Thank you.